Thank you to Bren. He's been an amazing part of CGC, and we're happy to have him as our MC again this year. So we'll probably ask him for next year as well. So uh, put that on your calendar. Anyway, hello and welcome, everyone. I have, I'm Celestino. I'm at Cedar sinai in LA. I have the distinct privilege of introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. David Beck. Dr. Beck received his MD-PhD at New York University School of Medicine, where he studied biochemistry and cell fate decisions. He performed further clinical training at Columbia University in internal medicine and at the NIH in clinical genetics. His postdoctoral research at NHGRI investigated the genetics and mechanisms of autoinflammatory syndromes. Many of us know of Dr. Beck from his seminal uh, paper describing the surprisingly common Vexus syndrome and isolating the gene responsible, UBA1. Additionally, in such a short time, um, they have already named the best therapies or working on naming the best therapies for these patients, truly demonstrating what we all want to do, which is personalized medicine. Currently, Dr. Beck is faculty at New York University School of Medicine, where he runs the Inflammatory Diseases Genetics Program, a translational program studying autoinflammatory diseases, including Vexus syndrome. Uh, he was the recipient of multiple awards, including the Burroughs Welcome Fund Career Awards for Medical Scientists, the K99R Series, and the NIH Director's Award. And so I am happy to hear from Dr. Beck. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, and uh, thank you for having me here. It's great to be here. I think I'm going to be a little bit of a change of pace from the other lectures, um, so bear with me. I think, you know, uh, I appreciate all the complexity with the variant classification that occurs when we know the genes, and when we have them on our panels, and when we accumulate variants of unturned significance. We're still in the early days here with the UBA1 mutations. So I'll take you on a little bit of a tour of how we found this, um, the overlap between inflammation and MDS, some of our um, initial findings with UBA1, and then how that dovetails into how we would like UBA1 to be on um, the molecular panel so we can generate the rich data that we're all discussing here. Um, so so um, I came to sort of this field in an indirect way, and partly I came from the uh, inflammation side. So uh, I'm a geneticist and I'm an internist, and um, we see patients with unexplained recurrent inflammation. And why we're interested in rheumatic diseases or inflammation is it really affects a quarter of the adult population. So this is just looking at the prediction in terms of the number of millions of individuals in the U.S. that will have rheumatic diseases um, by 2040. And the, the reason why um, I was drawn, and I think a lot of people are drawn to rheumatic diseases, is it's sort of a mirror world from hematology, where despite the fact that the same cells are involved, there are very few molecular diagnostic tools available. So why is that? Well, partly it's because these diseases are heterogeneous, they evolve over time, and the different subsets of rheumatic diseases can overlap. So patients can have overlap diseases between lupus, RA, and many of the classification criteria are subjective features, making it challenging to provide diagnoses. So there's few validated diagnostic criteria in rheumatology. So they lack the gold standard pathology, serology, laboratory values that we're all dependent on here to make the clinical diagnoses that you hear about with AML um, and other hematologic malignancies. And just to show you how um, dire the straits are for diagnosis in rheumatology is that classification criteria create lower sensitivity leading to misdiagnoses, especially in undifferentiated diseases. And really, the example is that 50% of individuals have diagnoses changed between visits, and 50% of patients who pre present with arthritis or inflammatory disease, sort of a general um, uh, presentation, remain unclassified. They can't get a diagnosis. They can't get treatment. So, and here, um, and basically the end of this is that rheumatology needs to move on to where hematology oncology is to be able to make some molecular diagnoses. And just as another way to sort of exemplify this is the um, treatment response. So not only are we not able to properly classify patients, but in many cases, 
we can't classify, uh, we can't treat them even when we have the classifications. So this is an example for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, the blue bars are complete remission of symptoms. ACR 70 is a 70% response, 50 is a 50% response. And this is uh, cross drugs that are the most effective for rheumatoid arthritis. As you can see, the vast majority of patients have over 50% 50% uh, at least of their symptoms after treatment. This is the best we're doing. This is how things are working in terms of rheumatology. So molecular diagnosis to be able to get patients access and molecular diagnosis to be able to find new targets that are helpful for these diseases. So genetics as a tool for diagnosis and treatment. You guys are well familiar with this, but I think other fields aren't quite as advanced in terms of this thinking. And what's known about inflammatory or rheumatic disease genetics? Here's just an example of the spectrum of genetic determinants that exist for Bichette syndrome. Um, this is just the combination of variants that we've been talking about represented a little differently with um, the x-axis being the allele frequency and the y-axis being the penetrance, uh, the um, uh, effect size. So, you know, there is a lot of work in genome-wide association studies in rheumatic diseases. And these are the variants that have been implicated as risk factors for Bichette's disease on the bottom right. Um, and there's a mixture of low frequency, mid impact variants that have been implicated in terms of disease. Uh, and then there are also monogenic drivers. And the monogenic drivers are just a small subset of these common diseases, but they still highlight disease pathogenesis, molecular mechanisms of disease. And so here's an example of the uh, implications of sort of these rare monogenic causes. We call them autoinflammatory diseases. So um, this was the original autoinflammatory disease. Some of you may have heard of it, familial Mediterranean fever. Um, so familial Mediterranean fever was identified, um, it was recognized in the 20th century um, in the, just in uh, Mediterranean families where there was recurrent fevers. The genetic cause was found in the late 90s and it was found to be pyrin or MEFV. Um, and the identification of this gene led to the identification of inflammasomes. So these are, this comes up in some cases in MDS that we think about targeting inflammasomes to decrease inflammation. Um, and so with the identification of inflammasomes, there was this idea of targeting the, the products of inflammasomes, which are cytokines. Inflammasomes work in many cases to release cytokines. So this has led to cytokine-directed therapies in which some of the original cytokine-directed therapies like IL-1 inhibition, which we all are familiar with, anakin or ankinimab, um, uh, some of the initial studies were actually used in these auto-inflammatory diseases as proof of principle, diseases that are driven by single cytokines and proving that inhibiting that single cytokine can lead to effective responses. Um, so, and that those implications have now led to IL-1 being used in a broad class of diseases, and some of you probably are familiar with the work where IL-1 is being used in clonal hematopoiesis. Um, so, I want to... Um, present today about how we identified a new genetic cause of inflammation and how that led us to sort of this overlap with myelodysplastic syndrome and cancer genetics. Um, and then I want to talk more broadly about somatic mutations and inflammatory diseases and why there's this overlap and how we should be considering it all together um, and not having it split across different groups um, and different panels. So, um, so typically in terms of these rare genetic discoveries, they happen in phenotype-first approaches. So this is basically finding patients who have a very unique, specific clinical manifestation, sequencing them, and looking for variants that segregate within families. So this is how monogenic diseases are found in, in small communities. Um, but as a postdoc at the NIH, I took a different approach. And the idea is to leverage some of the big biobanks that we have. Um, available and to look for genotype first, genes that we think might be important in disease. So using this approach, we can look for shared variants in genes that have not previously been implicated in humans, but there's evidence from lower eukaryotes or mammals um, in which we can see that it probably it may have a role in disease. Looking for shared variants and then going back and seeing what the phenotypes are. And this is particularly useful for adults in which we don't have family members to segregate the variants. So in children, we can always look at inheritance modes, um, but in adults, it's a little bit harder to find genetic causes. It's also helpful in heterogeneous diseases in which 
a priori, you have to select the disease you're going to sequence and only sequence that disease. That limits you from finding connections between different disease states. So taking this unbiased approach across large bio biobanks, looking for genetic causes that are shared, allows for these connections. So um, we were interested in this process of ubiquitilation. The reason ubiquitilation is a post-translational modification, a tagging process. Um, it tags proteins for degradation. It can also be involved in altering signaling pathways by affecting allosteric binding, enzymatic activity. And so the reason why we were interested in this is because many different monogenic diseases that cause inflammation were linked to ubiquitilation enzymes. So here's just an example of some of them. These are the proteasome-associated autoinflammatory diseases. Then there are these erasers, the uh, enzymes that remove ubiquitin, TNF-AIP3, which is A20, um, and otulin, which is a, another deubiquitase. And then the writers, um, this is an enzyme that places ubiquitin onto substrates. Um, so we asked, uh, could there be more enzymes in this pathway? Uh, that are implicated in inflammatory diseases. And the idea here is that these are just six or seven enzymes that were identified, but there are over 800 genes that are involved in the po process of ubiquitilation. Um, so using this sort of genotype-first approach, looking across uh, large cohorts of undiagnosed patients, we are able to find shared mutations in the gene UBA1 um, in three individuals that had recurrent inflammation and cytopenias. <clears throat> and these mutations were at the same position, the same amino acid. Um, what was initially confusing and less confusing for this audience, but more confusing for germline geneticists, is that uh, UBA1 is an X chromosomal gene, and the variants look to be heterozygous, but were found in men. <clears throat> so we uh, initially thought there might have been some um, aneuploidy in these individuals, but then we were able to determine that this was a somatic mutation. So this is shown here on the right, in which you can see there's a mixture of a wild-type allele and, in red and the mutant allele in blue. Um, <clears throat> and then the mutation is actually lineage-restricted. So it's found predominantly in the myeloid lineages, in the mature cells, um, and it's really absent in the lymphocytes. And this we were able to show, this is by Sanger, but by digital droplet PCR and NGS that the mutation is um, present to a high degree in the bone marrow precursors, uh, but becomes lineage restricted over time. <clears throat> so from these first 25 individuals, uh, uh, from the first three and then 25 that we reported in the New England Journal, we were able to find a few hundred now over the last couple years, and we've been able to better define the clinical characteristics of these individuals. So they're predominantly men um, with the median age of disease onset in their 60s, not what we typically think about for <laughs> auto-inflammatory or inflammatory diseases, um, this is a late onset disease, they can actually carry clinical diagnoses for known rheumatic diseases. Again, not truly undiagnosed, they carry clinical diagnoses, relapsing polychondritis, vasculitis, polyarteritis nodosa, but at the end of the day, these diagnoses don't quite fit. They don't fit in terms of treatment, they don't fit in terms of um, other manifestations that don't go along with the clinical diagnoses. So, and the interesting part was that we've seen that a significant percentage of the individuals have a predisposition to hematologic conditions. So uh, 30 to 40 percent, depending on the cohorts that have been analyzed, meet criteria for myelodysplastic syndrome. There's also uh, MPNs that have been reported with uh, UBA1 mutations, plasma cell dyscrasia, and we also see thrombosis, recurring clots. Um, and what's important is that despite meeting criteria for all of these different clinical diagnoses or entities, the phenotype is highly similar across individuals. It's late onset, treatment refractory inflammation where patients need steroids to keep their inflammation under control and have cytopenias. Now, how they meet criteria for different subsets of diseases is interesting, different subsets within the categories. I'll go into that a little bit more, but overall there is a phenotype, a general phenotype associated with this, which is not necessarily MDS, or myeloproliferative neoplasm, it's a spectrum. And that's kind of what we've talked about a lot with genetics today. Um, so I just want to take a step back now and tell you a little bit about UBA1. So UBA1 is the initiator of all cellular ubiquitilation. So I mentioned that ubiquitilation tags proteins for degradation, um, and that this process actually occurs through three steps that are sequential. E1 enzyme, 
uh, E2, E3. And there are two E1 enzymes in the cell, um, 40 E2s and 600 E3s. And the E3s are the substrate specific effectors, the BRCA1s, the ones that actually uh, engage with targets. UBA1 is actually the E1 enzyme responsible for over 99% of ubiquitization of the cell. So it's not at the level of a particular substrate, it's governing all cellular ubiquitization. And the original mutations that we identified occurred um, at uh, predominantly at methionine 41. So we saw mutations to valine, threonine, and leucine. <coughs> and um, what, we, what we know about UBA1, uh, what's been known for a long time, is that UBA1A, uh, UBA1 has two protein isoforms. They're translationally regulated. There's one that's nuclear that's initiated from methionine 1 called UBA1A. And there's a cytoplasmic form initiated from methionine 41 called UBA1B. And the initial mutations that we identified were all located on the initiation site for UBA1B. So we thought and expected that this would lead to loss of UBA1B. And it did. These are monocytes, predominantly mutant here, uh, Western blot looking at UBA1 levels. But what was surprising is that there was a new isoform produced um, that was slightly shorter, faster migrating. Um, and this was actually uh, um, a result of a new translation product just downstream of methionine 41 and methionine 67. I'm not gonna show you this data, but we could actually determine that this was methionine 67. But overall, this new isoform is defective. It's no longer a good enzyme. It's missing part of the um, enzymatic activity. So overall, in vexus patient cells, we have a loss of the UBA1B, catalytically active isoform, and emergence of an impaired isoform. So that leads to a decrease in terms of polyubiquitylation um, and an increase in these stress signals you can see on the right, the phospho-EIF2 alpha, LC3. <clears throat> so we named this disease vexus for the vacuoles um, that are present in the early erythroid and myeloid precursors. They're not present in all individuals or in all cells, but they are a sort of a identifiable feature of the disease. Um, E1 enzyme, X-linked, autoinflammatory, somatic syndrome. Um, and, you know, the name was based on, in part, what we saw when we saw these patients. Now, as testing is expanding, I think we'll learn more about this disease, whether or not all these features are present in all individuals, or whether or not UBA1 is going to be a driver of just MDS without inflammation. But this was, this was circa 2020. So... Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our work beyond the initial discovery. And one of the um, challenging parts about this disease was the high mortality that we identified. Originally, 40% of individuals were um, died within our study um, after identifying their UBA1 mutation. And some individuals seem to be relatively well controlled and stable. <clears throat> so we had this question, what are the determinants of the clinical severity in VEXA syndrome? Uh, so the study was really a collaboration between um, the uh, NIH, NYU, and um, bleeds in the UK. And we looked at patients who um, had genetic diagnoses of VEXIS. Um, they had the methionine 41 mutations. There are a couple of new mutations that have been identified. And we looked at survival analysis in terms of which factors affected survival um, and which VEXIS -related, related features independently associated with survival. So here, just a little bit more granular detail about the clinical manifestations in Vexus. Um, you know, this, again, depending on the ascertainment for these rare diseases, we are sort of inflammatory ascertainment. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of inflammation that we see in our patients. Skin, joint, lung, cartilage inflammation, but also some of the um, uh, hematologic manifestations. And all 83 individuals had macrocytic anemia. Uh, we looked at the clinical diagnoses in patients with Vexus uh, by genotype. So first you can see um, that the, uh, um, the relapsing polychondritis inflammatory diagnosis was present more commonly in the threonine individuals. Um, the fever disorder more common in the valine, so this is sort of the um, undifferentiated individuals. And then sweet syndrome, which is a neutrophilic dermatosis, I know sometimes is a harbinger of uh, hematologic malignancy. Um, this was found more commonly in the leucine patients. And MDS, we couldn't find an association with any of the different genotypes. Um, 
And when we looked at the demographics of the cohort, we didn't see any difference in terms of the uh, median age of onset or the sex distribution depending on the um, different mutations found. So across our cohort, we saw that there was a median survival time of 10 years for Vexus. Um, and when we substratified this by specific genotypes, um, we found that the valine genotype, this is a single nucleotide um, variant at the same position as the other two, just making a different missense mutation, actually conferred worse survival. Um, and this wasn't just us. Uh, a large French consortium um, uh, uh, kind of demonstrated the same feature with 116 patients. Uh, and this has been really exciting because the uh, French hematologists have been very focused on Vexus for the last couple of years in, a, in an organized manner, and they've been able to sort of confirm and strengthen some of the findings that come out of our cohort. So it's nice when you're sort of alone in a field to have some company. Um, so, so they see a similar trend where the valine mutation is more severe. Um, and then other independent predictors of mortality in patients, we found that the ear chondritis actually was a protective um, uh, uh, predictor in terms of survival, whereas transfusion dependence and the methionine 41 valine mutation were um, uh, worse prognostic indicators. So what's going on? How are mutations at the same residue conferring different levels of survival? How does that make any sense? Um, well, this gets back to the mechanism of disease, and I think that comes up in all this sort of clingen discussion. What, how, how do the mutations lead to disease, and do new mutations have the same mechanism? So the mechanism, we believe, is through translation, and a lot is known about translation. So translation is normally initiated from ATGs, but shown here on the left, these are in vitro reporter systems looking at different single nucleotide mutations within ATGs. You can see many different single nucleotide substitutions still allow for translation initiation, still pro protein production. Um, and interestingly enough, the three mutations that have the highest residual translation are the ones that we identify in Vexus. We don't identify any of the other mutations within Vexus patients or in healthy control populations, suggesting that there's something unique about these three mutations. And then methionine 41 valine seems to be on the lower end compared to the other two um, variants. So this led to the hypothesis, um, is the mutation leading to some differential amount of UBA1B, differential translation, and that the amount of UBA1B actually correlates with what's happening in terms of survival? Is that the mechanism of this difference? Um, why these single nucleotide variants have a different outcome? Um, so to test this, we went into patient cells, and we looked at the amount of UBA1B uh, that was left over. Sorry, this looks a little jumbled, um, a little PC Mac dance. Um, and the challenge here is that as you can see, the UBA1A, B, and C are quite close to each other on this western blot. The top is just because the proteins are only a couple kilodaltons apart. Um, and you can also see there's a challenge in terms of the variant allele fraction. These patients have different amounts of mutation present. So it's a little bit hard to quantify this, um, but we generated a tool that only recognizes UBA1A and B, not C, and tried to quantify the amount of production of um, UBA1B, and that's shown here on the right, that the valine mutation in patients is, makes less UBA1B as compared to leucine and threonine. It wasn't very satisfying. So the way to answer this question, aside from these small killed all differences, is to generate our own reporter, not with luciferase, but with the UBA1 protein. And to do this, we made a reporter system that had a tag that we can measure as an internal control, that's MBP, and UBA1B, and looked at the amount of production with these three different mutations. And alanine was used as a complete abrogation of the methionine 41, so all three nucleotides were lost. And as you can see here on the right, um, the leucine and threonine mutations make more UBA1B as compared to valine. Um, and this suggests that this uh, inverse correlation, the amount of uh, residual UBA1B inversely correlated with survival in patients. So the more UBA1B they had, the higher their survival was. Um, and consistent with what we saw in patient cells. But this also led to the question, why don't we see any other mutations in Vexus? Why just these three? There's a, another six possible single nucleotide mutations that could be at methionine 41. I mean, why aren't they seen in healthy individuals? So we actually made all these different mutations to see if there was something unique about the three Vexus mutations. And as you can see on the right, valine, threonine, and leucine make more than all of the other substitutions, and all the other substitutions 
kind of have residual at complete abrogation of the methionine 41. So sort of um, these are above a threshold, all the rest are at background, and these three mutations are unique. And this suggests that probably these other mutations don't exist in the general population or in Vexus because they may be too deleterious. UBA1 is an essential gene, and having too little of the UBA1B protein um, it, it may not be uh, 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 viable, especially in a somatic disease in which accumulation of a clone, survival advantage of a clone is necessary. So, um, and while we were working on this study, quite surprised to have a patient come in with a new um, mutation at the ATG site, not the three that have been reported in a few hundred cases now in the literature, but a novel uh, ATG mutation. So this was actually a methionine 41 to leucine mutation. I already mentioned leucine, but this is a different um, um, uh, single nucleotide variant leading to the same missense outcome. But interestingly enough, the patient had two mutations in cis. So it also had a G40A mutation and an M41L mutation together. And what we found is when we use our same approach, um, when we looked at the G40A mutation, it resulted in increased translation, increased production of UBA1B. When we looked at M41L TTG on its own, we could see that this was actually reduced compared to our threshold. But when the two mutations co-occur, it leads to back to the threshold level, back to the level of methionine 41V. And the reason why that is is because the G40A is within the ribosome recognition site. So it's probably a rescue mechanism to make more. The clone may not have lived, and having two mutations in cis allowed for the clone to expand. So this was an interesting proof of principle that these mutations can survive only in the setting of having um, increased production of uh, uh, protein product. So um, just to conclude this uh, first section, um, the Vexus disease uh, clinical severity correlates with variant type, transfusion dependence, and chondritis. This non-canonical translation of UBA1B inversely correlates with disease severity in vitro and in patient cells. So the more UBA1B patients have, the less severe their disease is. And so probably UBA1B um, sets a threshold for clonal overgrowth. And we think that that's important for considering um, treatment, how we would treat these diseases. Maybe UBA1B replacement could be uh, a mechanism of um, uh, clinical treatment. And this is further demonstrated by this novel genotype that we found that UBA1B levels are very tightly controlled in disease. Um, so to shift gears a little bit, uh, one of the things that um, we as rare disease geneticists sometimes are cautious about is what the implications are of finding for the broad population. Um, so we, I've shown you a little bit about our original cohort and the NIH Vexus cohort from, um, from the inverse correlation with UBA1B, but those were all ascertained. They were actually referred because they had phenotypes like our New England Journal paper, exact same phenotype. What happens if we take an unbiased approach across a big population database? So Geisinger Regeneron database um, has uh, 160,000 individuals that are sequenced in Western Pennsylvania. There's no ascertainment. It's all individuals within their health system, and they have both electronic health records and genomic health information, um, exome sequencing data. So looking across the Geisinger health system, we found 11 individuals with pathogenic mutations in UBA1. Um, nine of them were men, so we already identified a new feature, which were females. It's been reported in, in other, by other institutions. Um, and we had a similar age of onset, but the manifestations that were reported were very different. Um, we didn't see as much of the inflammation, the fevers, um, uh, skin, lung, cartilage involvement, but we did see the macrocytic anemia, and we did see um, the uh, MDS, which I'll show in another slide. So just suggesting that we may be um, only looking at one portion of the disease when we take our ascertainment based on inflammation, and more broadly, the disease might be a hematologic. Um, this is limited by what's reported in electronic health records, so it may be that they weren't quite coded for whatever reason. But um, uh, And so this is, again, sort of the unbiased view using the Geisinger health data, showing that the UBA1 mutation carriers um, compared to age, sex, and BMI-adjusted controls have decreased survival. Just showing that this mutation is not benign within the general population. And all of the individuals that we, um, so the prevalence within those individuals, uh, within the Geisinger cohort is one in 14,000. 
the uh, prevalence in men over the age of 50 is one in 4,000. And all of the men, all of the individuals that had these pathogenic mutations had disease. It was 100% penetrant. That's important because sometimes when you look at these uh, big health um, electronic health record, uh, genomic ascertainment studies, we see that it's only 10, 20 percent of pathogenic variants have uh, disease expressivity or any disease penetrance. Here we had 100 percent, just suggesting that our original findings are relevant uh, in broader populations. So the UBA1 pathogenic mutations are more common than the reported prevalence of the clinical diagnoses comprising the disease, so many of the diagnoses retained within Vexus um, are less common than Vexus itself. Um, I mentioned the penetrance. And then the expansion of the clinical phenotype. We don't know the extent of the clinical phenotype, but we do see new associations. If one or two individuals have dermatopolymyositis or CML, is that just chance population or associated with UBA1? Time will tell. The more testing we perform will help us figure this out. Um, and as I mentioned before, the previously reported Vexus features were not as common, um, and suggesting more broad testing and indications is warranted. So I'm excited to be here because we tried to make the last sentence in our JAMA paper, we would like this UBA1 gene to be added to uh, hemat hematologic panels uh, across the board so we could get some sense of the importance of it. We may not be there yet for it to be added to all panels, but at least, you know, in sort of um, forward-thinking uh, academic centers that are taking these risks trying to figure out the edges. We're excited to see where this goes because we don't know. <laughs> we'll only learn it together. Um, so with that, I just want to change gears and talk briefly about the more broad contribution of somatic mutations to inflammatory diseases. Um, so I think all of us are pretty well familiar with this uh, process of um, age-related clonal hematopoiesis in which um, in healthy individuals, as we get older, there is an accumulation of clonal mutations within our hematopoietic stem cells. Um, this occurs in at least 20 percent of elderly individuals, um, and this is predominantly at least thought to be in myeloid malignancy genes. It's a bottleneck in terms of the number of HSCs we have, um, and it leads to these sort of clones that, if they're large, confer risks for lots of age-related diseases blood cancers to some extent, but also cardiovascular disease, um, rheumatic diseases, infections. So this is sort of a, um, uh, a risk factor for many common diseases. Um, and this has been implicated in um, inflammation. So the idea with clonal hematopoiesis is that these myeloid malignancy genes confer a small amount of systemic circulating inflammation, IL-6, IL-1, and that confers the risk for age-related disease, and treatment with IL-1 or IL-6 inhibition can be beneficial. Um, and so part of the ha problem that's happened with understanding UBA1 is, is this the same process as age-related uh, clonal hematopoiesis, or is it distinct? Um, so to sort of answer that question, we, um, as a collaboration with Marinal Patniak um, and uh, Neil Young and Bavisha Patel at the NIH, we looked at clonal hematopoiesis in Vexus syndrome. Um, partly to see if some of the subgrouping of phenotypes might be dependent on co-occurring mutations. So this is just looking at uh, individuals with Vexus versus age match controls, and we saw that Vexus individuals who have more severe inflammation actually have more frequent CH mutations. Um, and this is sort of what's expected based on um, uh, inflammation promoting CH in some studies. Um, and when we actually get into the nitty-gritty of which mutations are found in these individuals, this is not for you to look at in detail, um, but what you can see is that we predominantly have DNMT3A and TET2 mutations reflecting what we see in the general population, that those are the most commonly mutated driver genes uh, for CH. But we also see that the individuals that M MDS, MPN, which are all the way to the left, um, do not have more CH mutations than the ones that do not have MDS, MPN. So it's not that the CH mutations are causing the co-occurrence of MDS. They seem like that's not what they're doing. Um, but what they are doing is CH mutations in terms of hazard ratio are some of the biggest drivers of mortality. So not through MDS, but through some other mechanism. And we believe that this is through contributing to more inflammation. So 
uh, but which is controlling this situation? You know, we think about CH in terms of inflammation. Usually it's modest inflammation. When we talk about Vexus and UBA1, these are patients that are steroid dependent, that have high inflammatory markers, severe inflammation. So when we actually go into single cell genomics, um, genotyping uh, patients who have co-occurring UBA1 mutations and CH, um, and this is limited by sample number and sort of no prospective data um, or limited prospective data. Uh, so what we see is that there are a couple of different scenarios. So one scenario is that patients can get TET2 or DNMT3A mutations early in disease. They'll have isolated clones here shown at the top in the yellow, uh, sorry, in the pink. And when they have the second mutation in terms of UBA1, the double mutated, the UBA1CH clone, actually takes over in the bone marrow, suggesting that the UBA1 clone has a fitness advantage over just the CH clone on its own. And the similar scenario happens when we look at a CH co-occurring patient, and we see that the UBA1 mutation occurs first, that clone is dominant. It doesn't matter that it gets a CH mutation, the UBA1 isolated clone or the UBA1CH clone, the UBA1 isolated clone still is predominant. Now this could be because of temporally when these occur, but it does suggest both in terms of clinical phenotype being discrete and that the clone takes over, that the UBA1 variant is driving the phenotype. Um, and we think this is important for thinking about how to treat these individuals, that UBA1 is the way that we should treat them based on their Vexus diagnosis as opposed to the other co-occurring mutations. Um, and that um, uh, brings me to the last point I want to talk about is how do we treat these individuals? We've had a lot of trouble figuring out effective therapies. Um, there's been a lot of effort both from the U.S. groups and um, French groups um, looking at different treatments retrospectively because these patients have been around. It's a new diagnosis, but the, the disease has been present for a long time. So we can actually look at what patients have been treated for. Um, and part of the problem is that every cytokine pathway is activated in these individuals. It's not that it's one pathway. We see many different cytokines elevated. So we wanted to understand this at the molecular level, um, looking at single cell RNA-seq, seeing if there's any specific cell subsets that might uncover the origin of disease. Where does this disease start? Is there a specific process that initiates it? And can we hit that with treatment that would benefit patients? So. Just yesterday, this, uh, our manuscript was accepted or published online in Cell Reports Medicine, looking at the early activation of pathways in UBA1 mutated hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. Um, and this study is basically a single cell um, RNA-seq and um, some genotyping to be able to evaluate uh, where, which pathways are elevated. And so I'll just summarize uh, the important findings here. Um, but um, the exciting part about this study was that we were actually able to identify not just the single cell RNA-seq profile in Vexus, but also the genotype of cells. So we can correlate not just cell identity, which is the classic use of single cell RNA-seq, but also mutant versus wild type. Um, and here's just showing a depiction of what we've seen is that mutant cells are predominantly, um, on the left we're looking at HSCs, on the, uh, uh, on the left we're looking at all bone marrow mononuclear cells, on the right we're looking at just HSCs, and you can see that wild type cells are predominantly outside, um, uh, um, or sorry, are predominantly in the lymphoid precursors, uh, which we've shown before, um, and mutant cells are predominantly within the mega erythroid and the grands um, lineages. So this is working the way we'd expect based on our previous sequencing efforts. And not to show you all of the data, not to go through a, an enormous amount of panels, but just to show you that we know that we couldn't resolve what is the original inflammatory pathway. There's not one cell type that's causing inflammation, and there's not one uh, type of inflammation. So here's just showing you one example. When we look at mutant versus wild type cells, we can see that the uh, mutant cells are driving inflammation, but they drive interferon alpha, interferon gamma to a large extent. We also see um, an increase in terms of TNF alpha, NF kappa B pathways. So again, it's not at the mutant versus wild type stage. It's not at a specific lineage. It's some global process. Um, which makes animal models where we can actually see disease onset critical for seeing what are the initiating um, uh, uh, inflammatory processes going on before patients get to this end stage multiple pathway process.
Um, so just to conclude this part, uh, Vexus is more commonly than previously expected. I think that um, we're, I'm surprised, I think um, uh, some of my colleagues are surprised that we can still find diseases like this. It kind of shows you the limitations of panel testing. It's great for variant interpretation. It's bad for finding diagnoses for patients who don't quite fit the bill. Um, Clonal hematopoiesis mutation are more common in Vexus, confer higher risk of mortality, but it is not what's causing the MDS, MPN subgroups. It's likely that's still UBA1 and why some patients go on to meeting MDS criteria versus some don't, we don't quite understand yet. So larger cohort studies are required for that. Um, UBA1 mutant cells dominate in the marrow and independent of co-occurring CH mutations. And the UBA1 mutant cells drive inflammation and overgrowth in a cell intrinsic manner. <coughs> this comes from the fact that UBA1 is a um, essential gene and these mutations are loss of function, hypomorphic. So how we could have a situation where this leads to um, overgrowth was unclear, but especially we've seen enough patients where they have a high increase in terms of the, um, they have large clones, clones 50, 60% of the uh, VAF within the peripheral blood. Um, it's clear that these cells, the mutant cells are driving this disease both by single cell RNA-seq um, uh, and the single cell genotyping. Um, so just to end, uh, you know, I'm excited to be places like this because although I'm an outsider, it's amazing to see that Vexus coming from, you know, a, you know, a germline genetic group, uh, coming from a place where it's inflammation in the title uh, is still finding its way into classification criteria. Where it should be in these classification criteria, should it be a subgroup of MDS, a subgroup of clonal cytopenia? We all need to sort of test more, think about this more. It doesn't come from one group as we hear from all these panels. Um, but, you know, it's exciting to see that. Uh, and, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, and patients are too, because they're getting access to treatments uh, that they wouldn't otherwise. So um, let's keep the arguing going. Um, and then um, there's an international Vexus working group that's uh, emerged uh, in France. There's over 60 clinicians and researchers, 15 countries and counting. Um, and the idea is to kind of define who should be tested, how they should be tested. You know, this question of the VAF, we're not finding low VAF patients, but should we be detecting them? How they should be treated? Should they be treated by their MDS MPN? Should they be treated by their Vexus? Uh, consensus criteria, applying them as we heard from one of the earlier speakers, we need to come to decisions, try them out, see how they work and move forward with that. So um, that's what we're trying to do as a group. And um, in my um, sphere, we have a multidisciplinary clinic for Vexus. I had a patient very astutely say to me, um, I don't want to see a hematologist or a rheumatologist. I want to see a vexisologist because depending on what's going on, you know, each doctor looks at one part of the elephant and pulls on it, right? So, you know, is it the, is the bone marrow the issue? Is the inflammation the issue? So we're trying to address that. Um, standard of care now, we've seen a lot of good benefits for IL-6 inhibition, JAK inhibitors, hypomethylating agents. We don't have prospective data. We know that different groups are trying prospective studies with the hypomethylating agents. Um, we're performing a natural history study um, at, the, at NYU, um, and I know the French and NIH are also, so we're going to combine. Um, and we have a clinical trial we're planning in the near future with a new um, uh, anti-inflammatory medication. Um, and we're getting emails from all over. So part of the problem is that with new diseases, patients suffer from lack of information. So we can't publish as fast as a patient wants to know. And, you know, a lot of these things are being treated off-label, so we're happy to help. Um, and so... With that, um, I'd just like to thank the large amount of help I've had throughout this project and this um, uh, understanding of excess and somatic mutations from my lab at NYU, trusting a new PI, um, the NIH groups who were just so instrumental, especially my postdoctoral mentor, Dan Kastner, and um, the Geisinger groups. And thank you all for your attention. Yes, thank you, Dr. Beck, for that awesome presentation because this is definitely an underserved field. So now there's, uh, we'll go to questions. Um, again, remember that you can submit questions online and I will be watching those as well. Thank you, Dr. Beck. That's a fascinating presentation. Um, so since this is a somatic disease, I guess my questions are two parts. What would be your idea of um, monitoring individuals to see when is it possibly coming? And that's the first part. The second part is 
there are genetic conditions, for example, uh, the newly published long telomere syndrome, where these individuals are germline predisposed to have a higher risk to develop HC mutations. Would you, would you see there are individuals like that? They are predisposed to have early development of, <coughs> of VAX as well? So the two questions. Thank you, thank you. Um, so for the, um, for the second question, um, the second question was about whether or not these, there's some defining characteristics about that, that predispose patients to have UBA1 vexus, right? Or uh, is this a predisposition syndrome for having CH? I mean, it's UBA1 and ubiquitation is critical in DNA damage. So you could imagine maybe somewhat similar to long telomere that there could be you know, aging problems that are occurring. We actually see in the same study that the, the patient cells show earlier aging via the DNA methylation signature. So, you know, the, uh, I'm not sure what the mechanism of why they have more CH in Vexus. It could be inflammation, but it could be other modes. And your first question about variant allele fraction monitoring. So in our cohort, we've looked if there's a correlation between VAF and disease severity, and we do not see any correlation um, within our um, patient population. Others have done the same thing. I think that can't be true. Um, I think it must be that we're looking at um, above a threshold, where once patients are above a certain number, then they have similar amounts of disease. And we're probably also, because we're looking at pooled peripheral blood, not looking at specific cell subtypes that might determine it. We know for hypomethylating agents that the VAF, the mutation presence or absence, confers the risk of whether or not they're going to have recurrence. So when patients respond, they have no more UBA1 mutation, they've obliterated the clone, um, and that leads to remission. So it will be useful, but we're not quite at the resolution to understand it yet. Thank you so much. Um, so do you know if, if it's easier to, to detect the mutations in the bone marrow or the peripheral blood or in cell-free DNA? So we haven't done cell-free DNA. Oh, we did a little bit of looking in serum and cell-free, um, and it was easy to detect it there. Um, the, in most cases, we found that we've only done a subset. It's similar VAF in between the peripheral blood and the bone marrow. Um, there are some subsets where the peripheral blood will be low, 9, 10%, and it'll be high in the bone marrow. We think this is a disease that accumulates in the bone marrow before there's severe symptom onset in the periphery. So that gets to the question of, I think that was asked in part, was surveillance, right? Are some of the patients who have very bland inflammation, would they have this mutation in their bone marrow before they have it in their peripheral blood? We wouldn't, that would not be a good indication for doing bone marrows, but we do think that it might be hang, there waiting um, and coming out under certain stresses. I'm going to take a quick question from the virtual audience. In your view, are the cytopenias seen in Vexus driven more by inflammation, ineffective hematopoiesis, or a combination of both? Um, so uh, I think it's a combination of both, and some individuals are very inflammatory. When we treat their inflammation, their uh, cytopenias improve. Some patients have very low levels of inflammation and they have primary bone marrow failure. In that case, inflammation doesn't touch them. I think once you've reached a certain point in terms of bone marrow failure, it's no longer inflammation dependent. But there is a period in which inflammation is driving some of the cytopenias. We don't have the richness of, you know, with rare disease and sort of um, referrals, we don't have that richness, but we do think it's multiple um, uh, uh, mechanisms. Thank you for a great talk. I am very interested in the sex differences, and I noticed that it seems like the visits is less frequent in the females. And my question is, did you notice any sex differences with uh, the UBA1 mutation, or is there any sex differences for hematological differentiation? Yeah, so we basically have only diagnosed men because the referrals, I think the way we presented it and have recognized for referrals is that it's men only. I think in the literature now and in our unbiased approach, one quarter of the individuals were, you know, two of one-fifth, two of them were female. So I think it's under-recognized um, in females. Uh, some of those have monosomy X, so they're effectively like men in terms of their sex chromosome status. 
Some of them don't in the literature. So I think it's probably underrecognized. We don't see a difference in terms of the clinical manifestations, at least in the retrospective um, analysis of them, but it may be that it's different in females because um, so, and obviously the mechanism could be um, X chromosomal inactivation driving the disease in euploid females, uh, but we don't have that information yet. Um, but it might be that a milder subset, right, yeah. could be defined in females that we didn't think about before. Um, yeah, I'd love to explore that more. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, that was great. I was wondering if you have any reason to um, suspect that there might, this might be sort of the, vexus might be uh, the tip of the iceberg and there might be a lot more uh, genes on the X chromosome with somatic variants and if those combined could somehow contribute in, in some small way to the, uh, uh, the difference, the male versus female difference in average lifespan. Ooh, okay. Well, so, so, so yeah, so you, you're, well, start from the top. Um, I think that there's no way to know how many somatic drivers of inflammation or inflammation overlap MDS are out there because if they're not the classic drivers that we're already looking at and we've just found one, whether or not that's relatively common, if we start sequencing more of these individuals outside of the panels, we may find them. So for my research program, we're doing gene discovery specifically on those overlap syndrome, severe inflammation, cytopenias to try to find more drivers. Um, and uh, be happy to take referrals or patients that you have challenging cases because we're not, you know, we do germline exome sequencing on childhood or familial cases, not adults with severe disease. So it's this hole in our understanding and panels are great, but they won't find what we don't already know. Um, so, so, and then the male predisposition, you know, across those cohorts where you see the MDS inflammation overlap, there's a couple from, one from the US, I'm not sure which group, and there's another from the French um, consortium where 20% of individuals with MDS will have autoimmune manifestations. I don't think they found a sex bias, but I do think, just like in germline disease, where there's an X-linked predominance for male disease, male-specific late onset diseases may be driven by male, by X chromosomal somatic mutations. The same principle should be true. So identifying those diseases, now I don't know about the male-female lifespan. That's a little, <laughs> that's a little bit. Uh, but I do think this, this is not gonna be the only example of this principle in somatic hematologic overlap or alternative, and there already are, right? Because you could think about Erdheim-Chester, but it's not quite the same. And it's not gonna be the only example of X-linked somatic mutations causing male-specific disease. Thank you so much. Great question. Hi. So I would be curious to hear more about the overall degradation process in these uh, in the cells of these patients. So, uh, do you observe more like ubiquitin independent uh, degradation, different forms of proteasome like SMB eight or nine? Yeah. So we've been seeing there's activation of the autophagy pathways. Um, the proteasome is overactivated, um, but in part it's hard to know if that's compensation or that's the stress of accumulation of unfolded protein response. Also, there's a second E1 um, that we've tested, the UBA6, UBA1. UBA6 only works with one of the 40 E2s. UBA1 works with the other 39. Um, UBA6 doesn't seem to compensate. It's not highly expressed. It's not more active. Um, part of the problem is we're still stuck mostly with patient cells and cellular models, and we're beginning to characterize that with mouse models. So stay tuned. Thank you. Yeah, the short question is: uh, uh, Is the uh, mutatic is it actually a clonal expansion on the stem cell level, or just a myelin overgrowth like a later stage? Um, is the clonal expansion in the myeloid stage or earlier stage? Just I mean, is it a stem cell expansion, or it's like a myelin overgrowth? After no, the absolutely. And I kind of glossed over this. Um, the somatic mutation is found in the earliest stem cell and it's found at the high, high variant allele fraction. So we believe the clone is initiated in the multipotent uh, progenitors and that you know, it then goes into all lineages, but in terms of the mature lymphocytes, it's absent. Um, and that might be because the unfolded protein response is very um, sensitive within lymphocytes. So can't make autoreactive uh, T, B cells um, and so those cells, it's well known that they are more sensitive to proteotoxic stress. Thank you.
Amazing talk and great work, thank you. Um, my question actually is about COVID. Um, I'm seeing more and more kind of in, you know inflammatory diseases that are showing up now with um, myeloid disorders, and I wonder if there if you see any relationship with that. Yeah, I mean we think that these patients are not as a driver of UBA1 mutations or as a driver of rheumatic severe rheumatic diseases. I think we're all trying to learn about long COVID in general, the in vaccines in general, whether or not they contribute to long-term immunity. And there's clearly evidence that they do to some extent. But I don't think that there's any role in terms of COVID causing this. But whether or not when you have a pro-inflammatory state and you get an inflammatory bolus, we've seen with vaccines, with severe infections, they're primed for more inflammation. It's much harder to control them. So we actually, you know, like procedurally, patients get more steroids when they go into procedures, sort of preparing for the stress response that's gonna lead to some more severe triggers. So not at the etiology stage, but at the sort of contributing to more severity. We've had a bunch of questions from the virtual audience, so I'll, I'll take one of them. Um, and this one's a great one for our audience as well. UBA1 is not currently included on many of the NGS panels that we use today. Given the clinical and heme path variability that you described, who is the ideal patient for single gene testing? You know, the single gene testing seems to be a remnant of astute clinicians that can only send one test, you know, and, and cost limitation. I think, you know, in terms of if you're in a center that is already panel focused, I think having them sent for heme path panels once UBA once added. I do think that the patients that have the exact phenotype that we report, relapsing polychondritis, MDS, men, cytopenias, steroid dependence, we know that we have a 50% diagnostic rate for Sanger over the variant. So both high level mutation, one region. So those would be great examples. But I, I just, you know, I think the other problem is that when we send these panels for patients who are very inflammatory and not bone marrow based and we get DNMT3A and TAT2 mutations, what are the implications for it? So, you know, I think anyone you're thinking about Vexus should get a panel because um, it'll help understand more about the marrow, but I do think that probably those patients, the other mutations aren't as relevant for what's happening with them if they're very inflammatory. So sorry, it's a little bit of a cop out. Um. Well, for the second part on that, um, so many of us who are designing new panels, uh, when we think about designing new panels, there's obviously covering the whole gene or yep. there's covering a region, right? So for UBA1, as you've described, it seems to be a region, but is there a reason to consider a whole gene or maybe intronic regions? So uh, we uh, believe, and we've seen now in our referrals, 90% of patients, other groups have seen this, at least with our ascertainment, are at the hotspot, methionine 41, but we see mutations throughout the coding area that we think are deleterious. Um, they've been reported now. Uh, there's other ways that you can affect the activity of UB1. So I think that the, at least all coding Axons and splice junctions are important, um, and there's more and more that are going to be reported soon. Yeah, I think there's a beautiful report. I usually show it from uh, the MLL in Germany, where they um, have found many potential new vexus mutations or ML, uh, myeloid malignancy drivers in UBA1 all throughout the gene. They find an enrichment for M41, so thank goodness. But they also find, um, you know, and they have hundreds of thousands of samples that they analyze. They find mutations all throughout the gene. And we've tested a lot of these molecularly, and we think that they do impact the protein. So whole gene. 